please. Thank you. Kind of hate to shut it. It's so nice. Hey, as we're getting settled in here this morning, please grab your Bible. Make your way. Book of Romans chapter 13 will be there in just a moment, Lord willing. I first just want to take a quick moment. A couple of announcements. Um, most importantly, uh, several things going on in the body. They haven't all hit the prayer request uh, line yet, but uh, a couple of them have. But in addition to that, our brother John is home with his mother this morning. Uh, something came up, so please continue to pray for uh, our father's wisdom as he guides our brother in his care uh, of his mother. Uh, also, today there will not be a presentation after the meal for the, the cleanup. Uh, just seeking the Lord on that. Like I said, uh, you, can, you can plan on one unless one stated otherwise. I just don't have the Lord's specific leading, and I don't really want to do anything without that. Um, also, fellowship meal afterwards. So, uh, you got your Bibles open to the book of Romans? Chapter 13, let's pray. Father, you moved, you moved our brother to pray exactly what was on my mind, Lord, as we were singing that. You gave us the privilege and the opportunity to speak to you, letting our requests be made known. Father, now we just add one further request. It's time for you to speak to us, Lord, by your Spirit, whether we're gathered here in person, Lord, whether people are joining us online this morning. Father, we want to hear from you. Make it personal. Lord, cause us to receive it with joy and thanksgiving. Help us to trust you to do all that you said you would, Lord, that we would see the power of, of God through your message and for your glory. We ask your will, giving thanks in faith, always in Jesus' name. Amen? So the most helpful thing I can tell you before we get into the verse by verse this morning of Romans chapter 13 is just to remind us that chapter 13 doesn't ha happen in isolation from the rest of this letter. None of it does. You guys know this. I'm just reminding you as well as me that this whole thing is connected and together it's called this letter, well, the message, the good news. It's the, the gospel, the power of God to salvation to all who believe. So we've been working our way through this and as we've said previously, this letter is laid out beginning with God who always takes the initiative here and it catalogs, it describes the things that God has done for fallen men, telling us the nature of how we've fallen and explaining his provision that we have in Jesus and what he has done for us. And as he gets done with that, he brings us up through these first 11 chapters, throwing in three chapters of how God works with Israel and what we're to learn from those examples. And then the book takes on a decided turn, knowing everything that comes before. In chapter 12, we see the opportunity for our response, the response of faith. And as I sought to relay what the Lord had given me, the, the idea is it isn't now that you know these first 11 chapters, get busy and work really hard to make chapter 12 happen, but rather this, the same God who moved heaven and earth to make this possible will continue to make the things that he's telling us in chapters 12 and following if we continue the way we started by trusting him, his word in faith. As we understand and learn what the Lord wants to make happen, we must just continue to look to him, to trust, to ask, and wait upon him as he indeed makes it happen. And as the Lord works in your life and our lives, that's the real power of God. I'm not diminishing the, the miraculous, the parting the Red Sea, the raising the dead, and all those things. But those things were signs to point us to the word so that each and every person would see, understand, receive, believe, trust. And God would work and make the things that he's already revealed 
the changes in our lives to make people like us into, well, a person like him, his son Jesus. So that's what's happening here. And because this is all connected, we're in chapter 13 this morning. I, I just want to back up one verse to get our mind re-engaged this morning. The Lord continues to teach us and instruct us when he says in Romans 12, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now again, this is the Lord doing this through us, but he's going to give us some very specific examples coming up. And he continues as we start in this morning with chapter 13, verse 1, when the Lord says, well, let me, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself, but I think it's helpful here. Do remember, who did the Lord first say this to? Christians where? Rome, good. That's going to be helpful for reasons you're going to see in a moment. But he also says it to Christians of all times and all places. It's his word. So he said it to the brothers and sisters in Christ in Rome first. And he says it to the brothers and sisters in Christ in, well, Northwest Ohio and Southeast Asia and everywhere around the world this morning when he says, let every soul be subject to to the governing authorities. You can't skip that every soul. Brothers and sisters, there's going to be a strong temptation to say, I don't think this pertains to me. Our flesh will look for some out, some loophole to get out of this. But the Lord is saying, let, just let this happen. Again, that word let, I love it because it says, not make it happen, but hey, you can just allow this to happen. And the governing authorities specifically, as we're going to see in more detail, uh, have a specific focus on what we call civil authorities. When you think about your, your mayor, your governor, your policeman, your administration of the nation or country that you live in, the civil authorities. We know spiritual authorities, this also applies, but he's focusing specifically on the civil let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. This is the, the big connection that every Christian first must understand, and then, well, you have to receive it and just trust this, because you're going to be faced with times when you're going to see some ungodly things in play by the authorities that are put in place. And the temptation would be to think there's no way that God could be allowing this to happen. Well, hopefully we all understand God's allowing everything to happen right now. But more than that, the very authorities, the administrations, the kings, the emperors, the governors, whatever and whenever they've been, have all been not only allowed, but by God's allowance and his direction, they've been put in place. That is exactly what God is saying. That is exactly what the Lord wants us to understand and how we are to look at this. Now, the temptation to think that way isn't altogether bad when we see authorities do something that's not pleasing to God. The problem comes when we start to take action according to our understanding and not what God says. Now, there's one area that we're going to be clear about and up front right away, right from the beginning. There's one and only one exception that God gives us in Scripture when you and I and we are not to, I'm going to use this word, obey the authorities the government appointed over us. And that's when the laws or commands of the government put us in direct opposition to the law of God. Right now we have a law of God that says you obey these people. But it comes down to when obeying the civil authorities makes it impossible for us to obey God. And there are clear examples given to us to help us understand. This isn't a new thing. We're going to put a couple scriptures on the screen this morning just to kind of jog our mind. You're not the first people who've been in this position. From the book of Exodus, chapter 1, 
verse 17, speaking, you remember the, the times, right? When, when Pharaoh, a picture of the world ruler, and there was, well, there was a promise of a deliverer coming from the Jewish people, so his, uh, his plan was to kill all the male Jewish babies, the children, so he gave a command to the uh, medical personnel of the time, the midwives, the gals who would assist in the birthing process, that you would, well, you would destroy these children. And up front, they flat didn't do it. And we're given a little bit of insight here in Exodus 1.17 when we read, but the midwives feared God. That was it. Do I obey the authority, Pharaoh and all his sub-rulers, or do I obey God? Well, if I'm in conflict about the command, always going with God. They feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded, but saved the male children alive. It doesn't matter what God-appointed authority tells you to murder. You don't, because God says, you shall not murder Continuing on with this in Daniel, and there's actually Daniel chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. I think we take it one uh, verse at a time here. Remember the scene? It's not quite as uh, bloody as murder, but it's every bit as serious. Here's the thing. It's not like you just worship the king when the music plays. Well, here we're given the account as the account is given to the ruler of Babylon. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery, this combined musical cacophony here, in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold, next verse, 311, the golden image, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province, verse 12, Babylon, Shadrach, and I, got, I know you guys knew this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. And hopefully you remember the rest of the account. In other words, to make it simple, the king of Babylon by decree said, when the music plays, you guys fall down and do that which God commands you must not do. And in short, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego said, not going to do it. And they didn't. And, well, hey, what happened there? Well, there was a consequence, wasn't there? But it also turned out as an amazing occasion to not only observe the power of God, but for others to see it also and to see God glorified. They were cast into the fiery furnace and as you remember, there was somebody else there with him. He didn't just have the appearance of the Son of God. He was the Son of God. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You need to understand that and hold on to it. Brothers and sisters, we have a promise from God that tribulation's gonna come. You're gonna be tested you're going to be in situations. I don't know if there will be a fiery furnace, but there will be a trial and a real present threat to your well-being. God will make sure of it because he did it with Jesus and he said, we're not greater than him. It's enough for us to be like him. Here's a more contemporary one, church age, that I think comes to everybody's mind, Acts chapter 5. Verse 29, we read the passage, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. There was a decree that went out from the religious authorities. Hey, you don't name the name of Christ. It cost these guys, but that was their answer. Think about it, religious people who represent the Lord. Should we listen to you or God? Because you two are in conflict here. Well, their choice was already made, and so should ours. So there are clear times when... You cannot, but it all comes down to one category when obeying the command would be denying God himself and as he has stated. So again, chapter 13, verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, here's the conclusion to help us to come to his frame of reference 
Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. The ordinance of God is the command of God. God has said, I command you, obey these people. If you don't go with that, you're resisting God's command. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. We've covered that in detail, but the Lord reminds us of that. Let me put this another way that makes sense in my mind. Resisting civil authority is resisting God himself. There's really no other way you can shake this out. You can't do any, any gymnastics with the original languages here. When it's a lawful command, and we have many examples, pay taxes, drive this speed, don't drive on these days, wear a mask. Hey, now you're getting, well, we'll get into that a little bit later. Well, I don't think so. I'm a child. Well, if you're a child of God, you would be like his boy, Jesus, and do what he says. And it all makes sense when we think about it. And I think that's why the teaching to help us remember this when and as these things are happening. Resisting civil authority is resisting God. Here's another scripture that comes to my mind from the book of Daniel, chapter 4, verse 17. A principle is brought forward here. And we're told, the decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. Again, there's a, a quick reference to, there's, there's a couple levels of when we talk about civil authority. There are those in the spiritual realm, and they have influence over those in the physical, right? But it goes on to say, in order that the living may know that, this is really what we're here for, the takeaway, the most high rules in the kingdom of men. If there's a king, if there's an emperor, if there's a president, if there's a prime minister... That's God's authority that God is ruling through to accomplish his purposes. And if you're alive, you need to know this, that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and check this out, gives it to whomever he will and sets it over it the lowest of men. He's like, I'm not going to obey him. He is so much of a lower character than I think he should. No, God does that on purpose. He also does that in the spiritual realm, does he not? According to 1 Corinthians, not many mighty, not many noble are called, right? Uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. So God's authority, again, stated in another place. So when we resist civil authorities giving lawful orders, not in conflict with God, well, there's another word that comes to my mind. It's a form of rebellion. Does that prompt anything in your mind? Bring any passages to your mind? How about this one from 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 23? For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. This is God's perspective. Well, I know it's just this, but I don't think I have to. Well, God looks at this as this is no less serious than you calling upon evil spirits and performing that which is unholy and rejected by God. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Well, I don't think I'm not going to do that. He's not the boss of me. Well, that's how God looks at it. It's sin. You're worshiping something other than me. Maybe yourself, but it's still all idolatry because you've rejected the word of the Lord. And There was a consequence, and you remember that this first applied to Saul. He took Saul out of his position. Keep this in mind. The Lord holds his civil authorities accountable also. It might not happen in the time frame that you like, but you can rest assured happens in the time frame that he likes and that he knows best. So our obedience is really obedience to one the Lord. Now I think we have we, and this is where it's going to get uh, a little bit contemporary and I think applicable for us. I think as citizens of this country and now this 21st century, I think we have influences and issues that other people in other nations don't. They have their own problems, right? But we've been, 
we've been raised with a certain set of values in, in this country of independence and you know, all of these ethics. And the problem is sometimes they're just flat in contradiction with what God says. Yeah, we might be physical citizens of this country, but if you're a child of God, your citizenship is in heaven. That's the eternal one. And now you're taking a new set of directions, and you're going to find it in conflict with some of the things that, well, some of the principles this country has been founded upon. And when we speak about the foundations of our country, we can see that it was both founded on godly principles and active rebellion. Here, let me use the Bible word, witchcraft, if you will. That's how God sees it. Well, what do you mean? Two specific examples, and I'm going to just, uh, I, won't, I won't put you on the spot, guys, but I'll, I'll give you an opportunity, young people, just to answer this. Just kind of curious, because when I was a kid, you know, and going through grade school, and admittedly, this was a long time ago, but they taught us about things, about the foundations of our country, and different times of years, like Thanksgiving, you know, when we just went through this, we would do these things, I still remember this in first grade, um, make things out of construction paper. I don't know if they still have construction paper, but it was a staple in grade school when I went through. And the art project for Thanksgiving was to make a cornucopia. Anybody else? I'm dating. Okay, you make a, it's the horn of plenty, this crazy shaped basket that was just filled with food. And what it did was it pointed back to the time of, well, supposedly the first Thanksgiving and the founders of this country and the time of the, the pilgrims. So here's my question, young people. Anybody ever heard of a pilgrim? Yep. What do you know about them? Where did they come from? Why did they come from someplace else? Did they come here? And by that confident answer that tells me just about everything that I was pretty sure of, there's a well-known principle that by changing what people understand about the past will impact how they live in the present. When we forget those foundations and then you can wash this through a generation, you'll totally change the course of a society or a country. That's actively here. But the history, and it's still available, tells us about, well, the foundation of our country. The land was discovered, Christopher Columbus, that's interesting. But when we talk about the pilgrims and more specifically the Puritans, you guys, do you guys remember that? Some of you who are as older as I do. These people came from, well, England, Holland actually, right? England via Holland. Uh, the Puritans, they're also known as separatists. They were called Puritans in act of derision because they were Christians who when they looked to the Lord and his word saw that what the church was didn't line up. They didn't want to be a part of it. They wanted to see a pure church. So they sought to separate themselves from the things that weren't good. And they got persecuted so much so they went to another country. When the new world was discovered, they thought that, well, this would be an opportunity to move there and do something for somebody else, right? Well, that's a little vague on purpose, right? But here's the thing, and here's how it more perfectly applies. These people, these Puritans, these brothers and sisters in Christ, looked to their Bible, and their Bible is the Geneva Bible of that particular time, and they would see commands like Romans chapter 13. And there's no authority. Do you know who their authority was? It was a guy named King James, right? King wasn't his name, it was his title, but King James. And wow, so, well, King, what do we do about that? The story of their voyage across the Atlantic, some 66 days, a storm, it broke the ship, and they were able to repair the ship. They got blown off course. Instead of landing in Virginia, they landed at Plymouth Rock, Cape Cod, right? And they had a problem because although in that crew of over 100 people, there was a good chunk, some 40 or some odd were Christians, there were a lot that weren't, right? And that's always conflict. And that ship was under contract by the merchant people who sent it there. Here's the deal, we'll send you guys as passengers, but we get a share of the profits from the new world, and it's all based on a contract, and the contract stipulated you land where you're supposed to land, and the storm threw them off, so the people said, the non-Christians said, 
<laughs> we're not where we're supposed to be. The contract is null and void. It's time for all of us to do whatever we want. The Christians realized the problem with that, and they said, no, we've we got to come up with a form of government here. We've got to have laws and orders. So they, they drafted a rough document to kind of form the framework for that. And many of you know that document to be the Mayflower Compact. Compact was another word for agreement. I want to read just a couple of, just a couple of sentences. This is a short document of this. But it starts out this way. And this was the beginning of the colonies of our country. In the name of God, amen. That sounds a little bit different than most of the legislation passing in this country today, doesn't it? And then these people, because they understood something, it's like, you know, we've got to have government. Lawlessness is not good, right? We've got to have some rules. So they got together, they formed this this agreement, this contract, this compact, and they said this, we whose names are underwritten, all of us who have signed below, they describe themselves this way, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James. Dread sovereign might not be familiar, but what it means is this, we recognize his God-given authority over us even though we're here. That's how it works. That's how our country started. By the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith. And then they said this, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country. Does that sound like a bunch of rebels to you? No. That sounds like people who really understood Romans chapter 13 and the verses that we're looking at this morning. The problem is, it wasn't that long after, and this was the year 1620, when we get to the 1700s, there was another group, as the colonies were more established, that formed uh, and wrote another document, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. Well, they adopted another, another phrase that still gets a lot of traction today at different times, and it is in quotes, and there's some variations of this, that it says, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Well, first off, we don't really find that in here at all. It's kind of a judgment. Well, what's a tyrant? Somebody who rules in a way that we don't like? taxes us more than we think he should, you know, we'll dress up like Indians or so the myth goes and dump the tea in the harbor kind of thing. We'll start the war of rebellion, also known as the Revolutionary War. That's very much a part of the founding of our country. Both teams always in play. And even today, people want to dismiss that as our country, on one hand, wanting to stand or recognize Christian principles, engages in a war of re revolution or rebellion. And it's not the only case. How about civil war, so-called? Godly men on both sides seeking God and saying, give us victory. And God just saying, you know, you're not supposed to be fighting. Hey, didn't I write something about where wars come from? You know, you lost covenant, do not have, and you don't have because you don't ask, so you war, you kill. More Americans died in that war than any other war. It's a war of rebellion. God sees that as witchcraft. Well, here's the thing. That's still popular today, and especially in today's day and age, and you see that, and people justify this. But it's not about anyone saying, you can't worship God, James, allowed them to worship the Lord. It wasn't about you can't have your Bible, you can't hold public service, you're not free to worship me. It was like, no, we don't like the cut that you're taking. We don't like your oversight. It's kicking into our lifestyle. So they rebelled and they sought to say, we're obeying God by doing this. Satan is very good at what he does. He's been working it in our country for a long time. The problem with that is you just don't see that in Scripture. Remember with me a couple people in the Bible. 
When things got really tough, or we might even say tyrannical, oppressive, did God's people form a revolution for political overthrow? I'm thinking of Joseph, served under Pharaoh. It got a little tough for him. He was a well-regarded man in prison. Did he, did he form a militia or a, a, a guerrilla warfare campaign? No, he didn't. Daniel? No, he served under many ungodly administrations. Both of these men are exemplar in that, and God honored that obedience to unjust authorities. Best always example, how about Jesus? Jesus, I mean, we're studying the book of Romans. It was the Roman Empire that put him to death, God's very ministers, to do that to his son to do us good. Kind of interesting. But we remember when Jesus formed the alliance to overthrow Rome or reform Rome and taught others to do that. No, you don't, because he didn't. And here's the thing, he doesn't change. Well, anybody else? The apostles, we just checked in with some of them. We're reading one of the books that the Lord used them to write. No, the church didn't do it. But yet today we have things like the Patriot Study Bible and the Pro... No. No, it's a deception. And it can have a very real impact on us. And we have to weed through these things, all these feelings... Because God doesn't say, pay your taxes unless you think it's too much. Then you can cheat and actually declare your dog as a dependent or something else. That's not something the Lord is going to honor. Obey your country as long as you're comfortable, or your government as long as you're comfortable with it. No. No. So about, what about when the government says the vaccine is mandatory? Hmm? been a lot of talk about that lately a lot of concern let me give you the short answer because I know not everybody sticks with it the bottom line is this is to do what God says to do but I would like to frame this a little bit more completely because we know that we're in a, in a time of what's been termed a pandemic vaccines apparently have been developed they're talking about implementing them and now there's already a talk about hey can you fly without this can you travel without this can you uh, I don't know buy sell or trade without this where this is going do we pass laws that say every citizen must get this we're not there yet but they're looking at that and if they do what is our response well I don't know what's in that thing What's the agenda? Bottom line, what does God say? Is it going to keep you from honoring the Lord? There's other aspects to this that I don't think we've thought about this. Well, let's just use common sense. God gave me a brain. Right? He gave us a brain that we would understand what he said and be submissive to him for his glory and our good. Well, Jesus is an example Jesus would never knowingly put something harmful in his body to do God's work. Oh, wait a minute. You think they disinfected the nails before they put him in? Did Jesus not die? I'm pretty sure that spear was dirty. I think Jesus understood what was going to happen to him. And he tells us a servant is not greater than his master. How about untold, unknown to us, scores of saints who went to the stake, who were torn apart by wild beasts, who, as Hebrews 11 tells us, were sawn in two, right? Out of obedience to God. I'm pretty sure that that was hazardous to their health kind of thing. But the tendency for all of us, brothers, is to say, you know what? I can obey God, but not I can obey the authority, but only if it's what I like or what seems good to me. We've got a bigger issue here, and we'll look at that a little bit because these verses carry tremendous impact in the day and age that we live in right now. Hey, you might be thinking, and just jot this down in your notes. Remember what Jesus told to his uh, apostles, his disciples, when he sent them out in Mark chapter 16, go out and preach the gospel. We're studying the gospel. 
He said, you know, things might happen. He said, signs will follow. He said, you know, you'll trample serpents. If you drink anything deadly, it won't harm you. That doesn't mean that things can't and won't happen to us, but that means that nothing will, as long as we're in the center of God's will, that he doesn't allow. If we're really looking for the power of God to accomplish his purpose, we should let him define it as he's seeking to do for the church in Rome and for the church in us. Here's a question that I think is really helpful. It's the one that the Lord uses with me when I face these things. And the situations change, but it's always the same, the same sort of impact on me. There's a situation. It might be a vaccine. It might be a new law, a new tax rate. And something of me doesn't like it. It's him pinging on my lifestyle or my comfort. Here's the question that's helpful for me to ask myself because the Lord says, test all things, examine yourself. When faced with these kinds of situations, ask yourself, am I more concerned about my personal comfort or God's glory? Most of the time, I would say all the time in my flesh, I'm more concerned about my personal comfort. But Jesus wasn't. Paul wasn't. The Holy Spirit still isn't. Jesus isn't either. Brothers and sisters, it's going to be extremely helpful because what that does is it gets my focus back on the Lord. It gets me in abiding contact and now the, the peace, the understanding, the wisdom, the power of God begins to minister to and through me. And we have this great cloud of witnesses that have gone through this exact path. It's the difficult way. It's the narrow gate. But it's the way that leads to God's honor and everlasting life. Walking with Jesus. Are we more concerned about our personal comfort or God's glory? Here's a passage that the Lord brought to my mind in study. From Acts chapter 20, we'll put it on the screen. Acts 20, verse 24. Now, in context, Paul is speaking to the church and the Holy Spirit has specifically told him, chains await you wherever you go. I'm going to be, well, he's going to be, remember Agabus coming and say, with the belt and said, thus says the Lord, and the, man, the man's going to be carried away just like this. Paul said, yeah, I know. Every place I go, the Lord's telling me the same thing through brothers. He's got a word. You remember where he was carried away to as a prisoner? It's helpful. We'll talk about it in a moment. But anyway, Paul's got the message. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. That's a huge step of growth, and that's the main takeaway. That's not the perspective of a person that said, life isn't precious, but the understanding that some things, or at least one thing, the glory of God is far more important. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. That's more important. God's got a purpose for me here, something he's doing, and that's more important than my life. The ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel, the good news, the message of the grace of God. This message understood and received that reconciles us to God. You know what that means, right? It reconnects us. It makes us like him. That's what's happening. Behold the power of God in our brother's testimony. You know, speaking contemporarily about the current pandemic, and it's a real thing, right? This thing apparently is exploiting other health issues and people are dying of it. But you know what? The virus isn't the real problem. It's not the enemy. Death itself is the enemy. Metaphorically speaking, imagine, if you will, that they come up with something and totally cures it, knocks out the virus. You have not solved the problem. People are still dying from all the other reasons. They're still going to spend eternity in torment, separated from God. Death, right? Unless you're raptured, 
something's going to take us out, brothers and sisters. You're not solving the problem. You're just, well, you're, I think we're deceiving ourselves when the real issue is, well, the death, physical, more importantly, spiritual, that separates us from God. I think Paul understood that really well by the teaching of the Holy Spirit. I don't count my life dear to myself. I only got a few years here anyway. So I've asked you a couple of leading questions because this came to my mind. Paul was carried away in chains, imprisoned in Rome twice. Right? We don't have all the details, but we have this. But um, Just quick helpful questions. To whom was this letter first written? Romans. Where did they live? Rome, key theme there. Who wrote it? Human instrument? Paul, the apostle. What happened to Paul? What do we know? I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us. We have some historical accounts. Everybody seems to be agreed. How did, how did Paul finish his days? Anybody aware of the story? The account? High cholesterol, too much good living, took him out eventually. House arrest. Paul was martyred, right? It's believed in the persecution of Caesar Nero. Caesar, the guy who, uh, you know, fiddled while Rome burned kind of thing. The madman himself. The second persecution after the great fire of Rome. Christians were persecuted. They spread lies that people will always accept something they want to believe, right? Why shouldn't you believe Christians? Christians ultimately at our best are the least offensive people with the most offensive message. You're not good enough. You're separated from God. You need to repent, those things, right? So just give me something I want to believe. One of the popular things that was told about Christians at that time is they're eating children, Okay, well, we can't have that. We've got to do something. So Christians underwent many waves, 10 distinct waves of persecution in Rome. Paul and Peter most likely were martyred under Nero's reign of persecution when it was open season on Christians. The people that this letter was written to, not long after this was written, a few years afterwards, but we've got this, obey the authorities. Then they would have gotten the first person account of Paul himself imprisoned, right? Didn't try to escape. Didn't try to overthrow or reform the government, but sought to obey the Lord. There's one tradition that says when it came time for Paul to be martyred, most likely by beheading on a place called Capitoline Hill, that when it was time and it was obvious... And we have some insight from Scripture. Paul must have known the end was there because he told Timothy, I finished the race. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He was forward-looking. The tradition says Paul ran up the hill to the, to the executioner's block and said, let's do this thing. Yeah, he didn't say that, but it wasn't like, no, no. And why wouldn't you? He knew where he was going. I don't want to miss the bus. Strong and helpful commentary about focus as Jesus who rebuked his disciples who tried to keep him from going to the cross. It's the Father's will. Brothers and sisters, this is real Christianity because this is Christ himself and his spirit ministering through the word. Let every soul be subject to to the governing authorities. Oh, it might be helpful to, to mention this too. And when the Christians that saw this, if, if you ever, the Lord ever leads you to Rome, you ever get a chance to go there, I've not been there, but this is on my list if the Lord would send me things to see. Take the catacomb tour. I've done it online. You can too. Google up Roman catacombs. The images are great, right? A catacomb is simply this. It's an underground or subterranean burial vault. Or actually, it's vast networks of it. Now, there, the Jewish people were there, the Roman pagans were there, and then there's Christians uh, there also. But before the Christians found favor and were buried there, historians tell us they met there because they were persecuted, they were hunted down, and then they were buried in these places. Later on, the Lord gave them favor. Satan took a different uh, tact, right? But here's a couple things that I found. If you take the tour, if you go down and you can see this online, 
they wrote things by the Christians' graves. You know, the brothers and sisters of that time and later that were buried there. Um, here's the kind of things that the Christians said of themselves or somebody else wrote about them after they died. Um, this brother said this, we can learn about the lives of early Christians from the epitaphs, the things written, that were left at a number of these catacombs, graves. One of them simply says, here lies Quintilian, a man of God, a firm believer in the Trinity. They must have known some doctrine, huh? Who loved chastity and rejected the allurements of this world. We just studied that in 1 John. Don't love the world or the things of this world. Another epitaph belongs to someone named Domitilla. It says, who believed in Jesus Christ together with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit did not deny the Lord. Many of these early catacomb epitaphs reference Christians' belief in the Trinity. It shows how important that doctrine was to the early church. Another of these, of these epitaphs reads, Here I rest, free from all anxiety. What I awaited has happened. When the coming of Christ occurs, I shall rise in peace. It's a wonderful testimony of resting in Christ. One of them addresses the person directly. Her name was Aproniana, and she was only five years and five months old when she died. Her epitaph says, Aproniana, you believed in God. You will live in Christ. Many of these. Another reads, Now I have received divine grace that I shall be welcomed in peace. Many of these were preceded by the earlier Christian symbol, the fish. One last epitaph simply says, this person was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, if I had any choice of what was written about me that was true, I don't think it would get any better than that. This person, I don't even need to know their name. This person served Jesus. So, our country's a little bit different. I found another quote that would be helpful. You know, Calvin Coolidge was a president of this country. Before he was a president, he was a governor. And he was speaking of the anniversary of the Mayflower Compact. And he quoted a well-known principle, and it would be helpful for us to understand before we leave these passages. Coolidge said this, Some governments are better than others, but any form of government is better than anarchy, and any attempt to tear down government is an attempt to wreck civilization. God is a God of order. He puts the government or the form of government in place that will best serve his purpose. Both biblically and historically, we see that the church did its best, thrived and reproduced under civil persecution. Makes it a lot easier to look to the Lord. And we know that our Father knows far more about this. And even government that, you know, it's, we're all prone to it. We think, oh man, the water prices going up. Hey, you got drinkable water at your, at your faucet. Oh, look at the electricity. You have electricity. You have. Well, the, the police don't come when I... There are police. The tendency is to focus on what we don't have and not focus on what we do have, and that finds its ultimate fulfillment, what we have in the Lord himself, who's chosen to work through these things, and not one of his promises is impacted or affected by the changing forms of government that must happen. So let's pick it up in verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. We're working against God, and he will discipline us. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? I hope we all do. Do what's good and you will have praise from the same. Christianity should be, on some level, really embraced by governing authorities. What do you teach those people? To obey the authorities and pay their taxes. Oh, obey the laws. Do good to others. And when they do bad to you, don't return it. Well, I wouldn't want a community full of that, right? We know there's spiritual aspects, and we're going to be persecuted for just naming the name of Christ, but there's that practical sense that does hold true. Daniel experienced it. High regard. So did Joseph. 
So did the church at the beginning, right? Nobody dared join themselves to them, but everybody held them in high regard because a city set on a hill can't be hidden. When the power of God is working through people, people don't deny the goodness of that. Speaking of authorities, the Lord continues. He, the minister, the civil authority is God's servant. That's what a minister, literally deacon, to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he's God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now again, capital punishment was God's plan from the time of the flood onward. We see a vastly changing government. Uh, that's not so much practiced anymore. Times are getting difficult, even more so when we must know what God says and depend upon him. Here's a conclusion, verse 5. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. He makes it practical. He said, listen to this. If you break the laws and you do all these things, he is empowered by the Lord to punish you. Reason one why you shouldn't do evil. But the greater reason is for conscience sake, knowing what's already been said. He's God's minister. You've just offended God, which is worse. How are you going to live with that? So this is why we obey. And it goes further, verse 6, for because of this you also pay taxes, for their God's minister is attending continually to this very thing. This might help you when it comes time at the end of the year or quarterly or however it's done with you to pay your taxes. I'm supporting the administration of God. Thank you, Lord. Direct this. Would you like some more? Well, that, that's, a, that's a leap that none of us are willing to take, right? But render to Caesar what is Caesar. You don't have to render more than what is Caesar. But render to God what is God's. All honor and respect. And part of this is to respect his authorities. Now, verse 8 is a bit of a transition, but it's also a recap. It forms the bridge to where the Lord takes us next in this letter, but it also helps us firmly anchor our thinking in regard to authorities, even unjust authorities, when they treat you badly. What should be my response to these people? Well, the Lord makes it clear, owe no one anything except to love one another. What what should be my response? What do I owe this guy? Well, as we're abiding, one thing comes out, fruit of the Spirit is love. The Lord says this very clearly. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, talking about laws, and he's going to recount a couple of them as we even have previously. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Neighbor isn't just the guy who lives next door. It's the people you interact with in your community. And if you think about it, you might even know the the policeman who patrols down. You might know the mayor. You might know, they're all, in a sense, your neighbors as well. Verse 10 tells us, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Right now, it's an if, but one day it's going to be a when. In God's redeemed, completed plan, when Christ comes back and rules King of kings, Lord of lords, love will be the law of the land. Love for the Lord and love to ourselves. That's the greatest commandment of the law, right? All of them hang on this thing. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We kind of struggle with that, and we'll talk about it as we conclude today. But that's what the Lord says. Remember what we said at the beginning? If the Lord says that, it's not up to us to make it happen. But the Lord says, hey, just let that happen. Romans has taught us that God has already poured forth his love. It's not me in my best efforts trying to make that happen, but it's me yielded to the Lord and the Lord through me saying, well, this guy's unjust. Yeah, he must not know me. And if he does, he's not abiding in me. 
Is there any way to help him? If only someone could show him a tangible example. Oh, but he just did something evil to me. Yeah, but don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. I think this takes us all the way back to chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Present yourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice. It's all connected. Let the Lord use his property to accomplish his purposes. I've got no problem with that. None of us do until we realize we're his property. Your life is not your own. You're bought at a price. That's what redeemed means. Let the Lord love other people through you. And do this. Now this connects us all the way back. Do these things. Do this. Knowing the time. Hey, if we could have said it was tough in Rome and it was, well, by virtue of the prophetic fulfillment, it's going to be a whole lot tougher in the days to come as we get closer. Jesus told us about that. It leads up to a time like no other. And the Spirit of God through our brother says the church, and I think he says it more loudly to us today, do this knowing the time, that now it's high time to awake out of sleep. We might have think, you know, the church might have been a little sleepy on this, a little slow to pick up on these things, and slower yet even to practice these things. But the Lord knows, and if his Spirit is speaking to us, is that if, if you're thinking that we're in the, at the end of the end times, It's high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Two very important things in that last sentence. First off, logically, every day that goes on, and we don't have a guarantee that this day finishes before the rapture, but if it does, we know we're one day closer. But here's the second thing, closer to what? Well, what the Lord just described is our salvation wait a minute, didn't we just say this was written to Christians? And aren't Christians saved? Well, it's just another reference to what Scripture teaches. Salvation is not a one-time act, but an ongoing promise, a process that includes many parts. Let me give you a, just a couple of support Scriptures quickly here. On screen, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 tells us so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation we're talking about when he appears we shall be like him as first John says right and that's well that's glorification time right there another verse first Peter chapter 1 verse 5 tells us of Christians who are kept by the power of God. Oh, I love that phrase. Through faith. As we trust him, we see God's power to make his will happen for salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. So quickly for review, we know salvation is God's process that he accomplishes and it consists of many parts. And what he's told us is that he's chosen us in him before the foundations of the earth. He has drawn us to himself and he's redeemed us. We've been justified or born again. We go through this growing process of sanctification, practically becoming more like him. The whole process wraps up, if you will, when we're face to face with Jesus and free of, well, free of this body of death, right? So he's looking at the end of the salvation process, not... Well, I'm justified, therefore I'm saved. Now now what do I do? That's always a pitfall. So the Lord tells us in this passage here that we should walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. I left off verse 12, excuse me. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Light is always the the metaphor for walking correctly with the Lord by faith. It's God living his life through us. Let us walk properly as in the day, not as in revelry, partying, drunkenness, self-explanatory, not in lewdness, that's explanatory too, and lust, not in strife and envy, right? 
No Christians out there holding the uh, Antifa signs or the, the BLM signs or I didn't get my way and I'm upset about it sign. Right? And you're going to pay sign. No. That's not us because that's not him. We're told put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told that also in Ephesians. It's explained many places. And make no provision for the flesh. We're going to wrap up here with, I think, the most important thing. Not a list of do's and don'ts, but where the Lord puts his focus as he transitions. Now, he told us specifically about obeying the authorities. And we know that there's some conflict and we know there's some concerns and there's some worries about that which must come. But you know what? The Lord doesn't have worries. If we do, we're not resting in him. We're not walking in him. We're not trusting him in him the Lord does have concerns right it's the lost those things we're told to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in our study on Wednesday the Lord gave it to us in stereo he said he who says I know him ought to walk just as he Jesus walked that's still true for today so our response to people the person of the Lord, his creation, owe no one anything but to love them. Right? How does that happen? This message is the power of God. Well, the power of God works by grace through faith. We, this is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord wants to do. I can let it happen. He gives us his word to recognize what should be happening, to recognize when it's not happening, a little helpful question, to test myself. Well, where's my focus here? Am I more concerned about my personal comfort or his glory? Oh, his glory. Oh, am I, did I respond in love to this person? Did I respond in love to the Lord? How do I know? Let's finish up here together. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As we go forward with thoughts about the Lord, well, I know the Lord said that, but I don't really think. Wait a minute, am I loving the Lord with that? Well, that person just did something terrible to me, so I'm, and maybe we don't do anything, but the Lord is looking at our hearts. Do I think that? It was like, how do I really feel about the authorities when they keep encroaching on my liberties? When they pass legislation that I just don't think they should, if they do, well, 1 Corinthians 13, God tells us, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I've become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So it puts our focus here, is it? Not that these other things are bad, but they're not the main thing. They're not the main fruit of the Spirit. They're not the one thing that God identifies himself. First John, God is love. So if I say I know him, I ought to walk like he is, and since God is love, First John 4, 8, well... When I'm abiding, this is what it should look like. When I think about the Lord, when I respond to the Lord, when I think about you, when I respond to you, when I think about those who are outside, when I have time to interact with them. Verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. First and foremost, his kindness through me and to me, to others, and to himself. Love does not envy. I'm not seeking anything that this world has, and I'm not seeking anything that the Lord has because I've already been given everything. I just want to realize it. It's not envy to desire what he's already given you. Love does not parade itself. I'm not seeking to promote myself I'm seeking to promote somebody else I think that's why that one epitaph resonated so strongly the person didn't even put their name this person served God <laughs> who were they seeking to promote it's not puffed up 
or arrogant. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. My comfort or God's glory is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Difficult times are coming, so I think verse 7 should speak extra importantly to us. Bears all things. And we're going to see some more things, brothers and sisters. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then the, the most magnificent thing of this list, verse 8, love never fails. If you want to see results, if you want to see God honored, if you want to see people impacted in a positive way, well, there it is. Let the Lord respond to them the way that he is teaching us, and it will be in love. It will look like this in every situation. In Romans chapter 13, our last verse, we're told to make no provision for the flesh. Brothers and sisters, if you ever find yourself with time on your hands, on board, looking for something to do, let me just gently encourage you. This one will keep you occupied, okay? No provision for the flesh. Well, what am I seeing? Oh, wait a minute. There's, there's things to do. I don't have it. I'm, I'm like, make no provision for my flesh. Speaking of our self-interests. Again, this particular section of Romans 13 as he focuses on his nature as love and what comes through us helps us to understand Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. Why wouldn't I? I love the Lord. I want him to have his way. He's proven his ways are better for me. Father, have your way. His ministers are an extension of him. Why wouldn't I obey him? I love him and by extension I love the fact that he's given me at least a somewhat orderly society with the full assurance that it's going to be perfect but right now I have a chance to be used by him to influence others to come to him and well the way I respond to his authority is a powerful witness well, when things will get difficult people will say horrible things and do horrible things to you yeah but the Lord isn't pouring out his wrath on him, on her, on them at this time. And he's not instructed me to. He said, rather, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There is no greater good than love. For he who loves is of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, at the very beginning, even before we gathered here to, to hear from your spirit connected with your word, we sang the song and I believe, Lord, your spirit was preparing us and it was already prompting us. Open our ears. Open our eyes. We want to hear you. We want to touch you. Lord, I'm praying that you have touched us. You have spoken to us. Things that are impossible for us, Lord, but not for you. Teaching us, Lord, that we must depend on you. We must look to you. I want to pray for myself, Father, and all my brothers and sisters and those who might be uh, listening even to the recording should you so choose. There's no part of your word that is less or more important than the other. It's all necessary. Lord, let not the word that you have spoken, that you have preserved in your book be either picked up by the birds, Lord, or fall among stony places or choked out by weeds. But let it find fertile soil, good prepared hearts, Lord, that through it you would bring forth abundantly your fruit for your glory. These things and all your will we ask as we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Shall we stand and sing his praises?